Well, good morning, Good Shepherd. I'm Talbot Davis, and I am the pastor here at Good Shepherd Church. Always glad to welcome you, you live streamers and you live people. Always good to be able to connect with you. And this is the first uh, Sunday of a new series. Some people get all the breaks. And uh, this particular message is called Broken Faith. And this message, like all the messages in this series, come from the Old Testament book of Ecclesiastes. And so if you have your Bible with you, and it looks anything like this, locate the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 1. Just keep your finger there. Maybe your Bible's loaded onto your phone. Scroll to the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 1 and just hold it there as well. And if you like, you didn't bring your Bible and it's not loaded on your phone, Uh, The words are going to be up on the screen at just the right time because, hello, they always are. And we love for that to happen, for you all to be able to see the Scripture for yourself because there's a number of things that we believe about the Bible at Good Shepherd. And and, uh, some of you have never heard this stuff before and others of you have, but one of those things we believe about the Bible, this looks like a book, but believe me, it is not a book. It's a library. A collection of a lot of books written by a lot of authors and get over a long span of time and get this in many, many different writing styles. The book of Ecclesiastes, which we're looking at today and for the next four weeks, it's in the section of the Bible that people often call wisdom literature, that that's the writing style, wisdom literature. It would actually, and you'll see this throughout the series, it actually be more truthful to say the book of Ecclesiastes is the the therapy session that's in the Bible. We, we get what it's like when a guy is on the couch talking to his therapist, giving a stream of consciousness and God inspired it and we have it in the biblical library. And you'll see how all of that comes to pass in the, not only today, but in the weeks ahead. But the other thing that we believe at this church about the Bible, and you, you may not be there yet, But in in spite of an admittedly odd, strange, different book like Ecclesiastes making it in, we believe the whole collection is God-breathed, God-inspired, and that God made it inspired and eternal and true. And out of that belief that we share, at least in leadership here, we do a different thing when we're talking about the Bible. We lift it up. And if you haven't been here before and you're looking around and there's Bibles in the air and phones in the air and and part of you like, this is the weirdest thing I've ever seen. We would be like, we're not defensive about that. We're like, yeah, it is kind of weird. But we've discovered together that we're a collection of people. We don't have it all figured out. Can I hear an amen? And we don't have our lives all put together. Can I hear an amen? But we know who has authority over our lives and it's not us. And we're glad to place ourselves under the authority of the word. Amen. And uh, before I say anything else, let's pray. God, you're good. And I'm powerless. God, because you're good, I'm not helpless. Fill me today with joy and truth and insight. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, we're starting uh, this brand new series today, as you have heard, and, and I, I think I want to ask in advance for your understanding, for your, forbe- for your forgiveness, if I get just a little bit too excited about it, will, will y'all be kind of forgiving? You'll be kind of understanding if I get just a little bit keyed up. I'm not hearing any, seeing any nods of the head that if I get just a little bit too keyed up about this series. And one of the reasons I am so excited about this series is because for the first time ever, at least that I can think of, this is a series in which the book's author is actually a little bit more important than the book itself. As in the the guy who writes the book, understanding him is even a little bit more important than understanding the content that he writes. I I guess this is a long way of saying, when it comes to the book of Ecclesiastes, you can't understand anything this book says until you get the state of mind of the guy who says it. Because the series that we are looking at, uh, talking about is, some people get all the breaks. And the, uh, the book is Ecclesiastes in the Old Testament. And the author is Solomon. 
And the reason that we know, and some of you may know who Solomon is, and some of you have, may have no idea who Solomon is, and either way, that's okay. But the way that we know that Solomon is the author is because of Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 1, and chapter 1, verse 12, the book ends to today's reading. So take a look at what it says. The words of the teacher, the son of David, the king in Jerusalem. And verse 12... I, the teacher, was king over Israel in Jerusalem. So you put those two verses together and it's quite clear that Ecclesiastes is written by Solomon. And again, you may never have heard of Solomon or you may have heard of him and don't know much about him, about him but talk about, about a guy who got all the breaks. I mean, every break conceivable and then some. First of all, he's not born only into a family, but he's born into a royal family, kind of like Harry and, what's the other one's name? Harry and Meghan, those people, you know, the royals. <laughs> William, that's the other one's name. Uh, he, he's, born into the, into, he's born into the royals as a royal, which means he's gonna have every need met, He's going to have servants at his beck and call. He's going to have this sumptuous diet, I mean, full of calories and nutrition when his people are going through famine. I mean, he has everything all the time, anything he wants, whenever he wants it, and all of it with the knowledge that when his dad dies, he's going to step right into the role of king for himself and he becomes king not because of anything that he accomplished or not because of any special insight that he had, but he becomes the king just because of where and how and to whom he was born. And that's exactly what happens to him. His dad dies and his dad, again, you may, may or may not know this, and his dad is David. Yeah, that David, the one with Goliath, the one with Bathsheba, the the one with Psalm 23, that David, he dies. It's about 950 BC, so about 3,000 years ago. He dies and Solomon succeeds him as the king. And when Solomon succeeds him as the king over Israel 3,000 years ago, woo, Solomon succeeds at succession. He, He ushers in, this unbelievable era of unparalleled prosperity and favor for the nation Israel. I mean, they have influence and they have riches and they have power. And some of the riches that they have under Solomon's rule, because he's so good at being a king, he succeeds at succession. Some of that, the, the riches that they get spill over, hello, into Solomon's own personal coffers. He's sort of like the original oligarch. In addition to all that, I mean, wine, and women, and song, and money, and stuff, and food. In addition to all that, I mean, he got all the breaks. God gives him one other really big break. God gives him this unparalleled amount of wisdom. And, and, and you know what wisdom is, don't you? The difference between wisdom and knowledge. Knowledge is, is the awareness that a tomato is a fruit and not a vegetable. And wisdom is the awareness never to put a tomato in fruit salad. That's, that's, you're welcome for that. Thank you. That's, so Solomon, Solomon had that kind of wisdom. And, and in fact, it's the, the, the Bible, remember the Bible's a library and Ecclesiastes is Solomon's memoir, really Solomon's memoir from his therapist's couch. But the book of First Kings, which is in the history section of the biblical library, it adds color and it adds texture to what Solomon's life and reign was like. And I want you to be able to see this or hear this for yourself. First Kings chapter 10, verses 14 through 22. Take a look up on the screen as, as I read this. The weight of the gold that Solomon received yearly was 666. Don't get a, ooh, 666. No, that's in the book of Revelation. That's not here. The 666 means nothing. Not including the revenues from the merchants and the traders and from all the Arabian kings and the governors of the territories. King Solomon made 200 large shields of hammered gold. 600 shekels of gold went into each shield. He also made 300 small shields of hammered gold and three minas of gold in each shield. 
the king put them in the palace of the forest of Lebanon. Then the king made a great throne covered with ivory from elephants and overlaid with fine gold. And the throne had six steps and its back had a rounded top. On both sides of the seat were armrests and a lion standing, not a real lion that would make it complicated to sit there, standing beside each of them. Twelve lions stood on the six steps, one at, each, at, at either end of each step. Nothing like it had ever been made for any other kingdom. All King Solomon goblets were gold, and all the household articles in the palace of the forest of Lebanon were pure gold. Nothing was made of silver, because silver was for losers. <laughs> oh, it, that added. Silver was considered of little value in Solomon's day, and then he kind of brings it all to a close with this flourish in verse 22. The king had a fleet of trading ships at sea along with the ships of Hiram. Once every three years it returned, carrying gold and silver and ivory and apes and baboons. I mean, as if you couldn't have enough. He gets apes. He's got his own version of Neverland going on. Apes and baboons, his private zoo. Solomon has it going on. Some people get all the breaks and some people know how to leverage the breaks they get to make even more breaks. And that's Solomon to a T. And, and, and one other thing that Solomon has going on, this man who got all the breaks. With all this wisdom that God had given him, you know, the thing about tomatoes and fruit salad, he wrote a book. And the book that Solomon wrote was called Proverbs. And Proverbs is this timeless collection of timely wisdom that made it into the Bible. And it's actually a little bit nervy because here this guy who got all the breaks, he writes a book telling people how to make their own breaks. But, Sol but Proverbs is so good and so wise. It's, it's been the source of sermons for preachers for millennia, including, get this, my, my very first sermon series that I ever gave over 30 years ago was on the book of Proverbs. And you want to know what I called it? You ready? You want to know what I called that sermons? It was called Proverbs. How's, how's that for clever? So Solomon at this stage, he has caught all the breaks, wealth, prestige, power, influence, apes, baboons, nutrition, anything, he, everything all the time. And that is Solomon's life. He caught all the breaks. In fact, he caught so many breaks that he was broken by them. Yeah, Solomon got all the breaks and ended up being broken by the very breaks that he had received. His good fortune became his undoing. And I say that because of where Solomon goes immediately in the book of Ecclesiastes. After introducing himself in verse chapter 1 and verse 1, the words of the teacher, the son of David, the king of Jerusalem, I am the king, I've had all the breaks. Where does he go he immediately without pass and go into verse 2? Meaningless. Meaningless, says the teacher. Utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. Some of you know the translation that says vanity. Vanity. Everything is vanity. And oh my goodness. He, one minute, he's on top of the world, a looking down on creation. And the next minute, he is in the absolute pits of despair. I have it all, enjoy it all, am immersed in it all, and it all makes me miserable. Meaningless. Meaningless. And, and, and you have to wonder, well, how did he get there? How does Solomon go from getting all the, the breaks to being an absolutely broken Man, and why does all of this stuff make it into the Bible anyway? How does Solomon go from here to here where he as an individual is broken and we could very easily say that his faith is broken? And why, why does God inspire a book like this in the Bible anyway? 
It's a question worth ask, asking, a topic worth pondering, because you know what? I don't think Solomon is the last one. I don't think Solomon is the last one to get all the breaks, and good looks and good relationship and good nutrition and apes and baboons and everything you want all the time. And the more he got, the more miserable he became. It's like those children on a Christmas morning and, and the family room floor is strewn with empty boxes and wrapping paper and they look up at mom and dad and they ask, is, is that all there is? Or you get the promotion, that promotion you've longed for and lobbied for and you get that promotion and six weeks after getting that promotion, you're like, is this what I worked all this time for? Or you get the girl and the girl says yes and you marry the girl and three months into the, the marriage, you look around your life and you look around at this marriage and, and you're like, oh my word, what have I gotten myself into? Or you save and you save and you save and you design and you design and you design and you build and you build and you build and you finally move into the house of your dreams. And six months later, you realize that all the problems that you had, they moved right with you from that old house into the new house. Because hello, everywhere you go, there you are. Yeah, Solomon is not the last one to have it all. And the all that he had just made him feel emptier than he ever did at the beginning Solomon is, some of you might have heard that line that, that, that how I'm doing doesn't depend on how life is going. How I'm doing doesn't depend on how things are going. So Solomon's the reverse. How I'm doing doesn't depend on how things are going because things are going great. I, I've got it all and I'm absolutely miserable inside. It's despair. It's depression. It's clinical. It's chemical. And people who've never had it can't comprehend it. And those of you who wrestle with it can't imagine life any other way. And the end result of what Solomon goes through and the end result of what so many of you go through is that there is, you start out on top of the world and you end up with a broken faith. And you, when you end up with a broken faith, you're like, everything's meaningless, vanity, vanity, all is vanity. And, and do you know what is especially dangerous about broken faith? That, that a broken faith is not someone who doesn't believe anymore. It's someone who does still believe, but it just doesn't matter. And that's even more dangerous. A broken faith is someone who, who says, yeah, I, I believe that God exists, but I don't really care. Or I'm sure that Jesus rose from the dead, but I, I don't really feel him. Or I wish I could believe in Christianity, but then I keep one of those Christian steps up and enters my life again, and I just can't do it anymore. Yeah, it's not atheist, it's not agnostic, it is something much, much more dangerous. A broken faith is a who cares faith. And I suspect that I'm speaking right now to more than a few people who are right at that place. And so it's wise for us to wonder, well, how did, how did Solomon get from here to here? How did he get from chapter one? Hey, I'm the king to verse two. I'm miserable. How did he get there? Well, well take a look. Take a look at verses three through seven. And, and remember, it's kind of stream of consciousness. He's on his therapist's couch. He's pouring out his heart. And look at what he says in verses three and following. What do people gain from all their labors at which they toil under the sun? You might want to underline under the sun because it's going to repeat. Generations come and generations go, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun sets and hurries back to where it rises. The wind blows to the south and it turns to the north. Round and round it goes, ever returning on its course. 
all streams flow into the sea, yet the sea is never full to the place the streams come from, there they return again. And notice that in Solomon's mind, all of life is cycles and patterns and repetition and routine. There really is nothing new under the sun. It's the same old, same old. And then skip down to verse nine, where he really brings it home with a book in. What has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There is nothing new, where? Under the sun. Ah, under the sun in verse three, nothing new under the sun in verse nine. And in that repetition, all of a sudden, you see how it is not only, not only that Solomon got to his place of misery and despair, but maybe even better, why it is that God allowed a book like this to make it into the inspired biblical library to begin with. And, and, and when he says there's nothing new under the sun, you understand, you see how Solomon gets to his place of misery and despair because that's where he limits his vision. His, his life, his vision is limited to what he can see. He, when, when all you have in this life is this life, when there's nothing more to life than this life, of course you become jaded and cynical and hollow. When, when you have no sense that there is a life, hello, beyond the sun, behind the sun, until you understand there is more to this life than this life, you remain miserable. And when you see that, when you get that, all of a sudden it becomes also clear why it is that God allows this extended therapy session into the Bible. And it's because Solomon, in this case, he's not, he's not a role model. He's our object lesson. He's the anti-hero. That Solomon is here. God allows Solomon, I don't know if you know this or not, I've, I've said it before, but God allows a man going through what we would today call clinical depression. How good is God? That God takes a man like that going through clinical depression. I've, I've, I've said before, I believe that Solomon wrote Proverbs, the book of Proverbs, man, life is good. You can figure it out, make your own breaks. He was on his meds. And when he wrote Ecclesiastes, I've had everything and everything is worthless and painless and painful and, and vanity. He was off them. But God is so good because he inspired a man in that emotional and mental condition to write a book that made it into the Bible because he knew so many of you would walk that same journey in your own lives. And when we see there's nothing new under the sun in verse three, and there's nothing new under the sun in verse nine. All of a sudden, we're not supposed to be like Solomon here. We're supposed to learn from his limited vision. And here's what I want you to know today. If your faith is broken, here's what I want you to know. Let what you can see remind you of who you can't see. Look, let everything that you can see in this life, whether it's relationships or whether it's nature or whether it's difficulty and pain or whether it's joy and beauty, let everything that you can see remind you of who you can't, that there is one beyond the sun, behind the sun, who everything good that is on earth pales in comparison with how great it is in his realm. Because here's what I know about some of you who have a broken faith. Some of you who really need this word today, let what you can see remind you of who you can't. Your vision is completely limited to what you can see, what you experience. You have more faith in the things that you can see and go through than in the God you can't right now. Like some of you. Some of you have more faith in your despair than you, you, than you have in anything else. You, you hold on to your despair you nurse your despair. Secretly, you love your, de your despair as your identity. Others of you have faith in other people's hypocrisy. You set your clock by it. You're watching for other people to stumble. And, and whenever you see another person, especially another Christian, when, when you see them stumble, when you see them live into hypocrisy, you're like, yep, 
There goes another one. Your faith just gets confirmed. Others of you, 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 have, a lot, you have a lot of faith in your illnesses. You define yourself. You understand yourself by your pains, by your sicknesses, by the sicknesses you might get. And by having so much faith in your sicknesses and in your conditions, you have limited your life. You have actually paralyzed yourself. And in all that, when when we have this faith and these things that we can see, we're just demonstrating we got all kinds of faith in the storm and we don't have any faith in the God of the calm. Well, what a good day. What a good time to name that going on in your life and to rebuke it and to recover a genuine faith where you let everything that you can see remind you of who you can. It's why I love that license plate of this friend of mine who goes to our church and some of you are like, you are so weird, Talbot, to love a license plate. No, I'm not. This is a guy in our church. Obviously, he lives in South Kakalaki and his license plate Second, that says Second Core 418. You know what that means? Second Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18. You want to know what that verse says? Second Corinthians 418 puts it this way. We fix our eyes. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. I love that. Love it so much that that in our house, when our daughter was in middle school, she jotted that verse down on a piece of paper and she put it up on her bookcase in her room. As a reminder, that was her life verse. Well, uh, that same daughter who was in middle school when she did that, she's now 32 and she lives in Nashville. But don't you, you better believe that verse is still up on that bookcase that's still in her bedroom. And it's still a life verse for our family. And still this reminder. Let what you can see remind you of who you can't. Or it's it's like that guy I met in the lobby of a hotel in Texas earlier this year. And I'd never seen him before. And we passed each other in the lobby. And he goes, well, how are you doing today? And I was like, well, what's it to you, buddy? And and, no, no. No, I, pr- I promise I have good manners. He, how are you doing today? And I, I'm, I'm good. How are you? And, and, and he goes, well, I can't complain. And maybe I was feeling just a little bit feisty that day. So, so I came back and, and I said, but would you complain if you could? And without missing a beat, he says, no, rehab's too expensive and Jesus really cares. Isn't that awesome? He gets it. Let what you can see remind you of who you can't see. Because everything that we know and everything that we see and everything that we understand, I don't know, some of you, some of you, you may be loving life. Your situation may be great. You might have caught all the breaks and you're not made miserable by them. Even you, I want you to know this, that there's not one thing that you enjoy in this life that Jesus doesn't do a thousand times better in the next one. Let what you can see remind you of who you can't. Because this God I'm talking about, he is, he's so amazing. He's, He's so remarkable. And you know why I say that? You know why I am so sure of God's goodness and God's joy? Because of the book of Ecclesiastes. Yeah, I go to Ecclesiastes for inspiration a lot more than I go to John 3.16 for God so loved. Now that's good. Don't, Talbot doesn't like John 3.16. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that when I really want to appreciate the wonder and the beauty and the brilliance of God, I go to the book of Ecclesiastes. Why? Because our God is so emotionally secure that he dares to inspire an entire book that questions his job performance. 
Yeah, the, the book of Ecclesiastes over and over and over questions God and questions God's job performance. And our God says, I get it, that's okay. I'm going to inspire this and I'm going to keep these words in the permanent record. I'm gonna keep this therapy session available for all people of all time. Yeah, Solomon was on his meds when he wrote Proverbs and Solomon was off him when he wrote Ecclesiastes and I'm keeping them both there. Because how good is God? Here's how good God is. He knew 3,000 years ago that if he inspired a biblical book written by a man going through clinical depression, he knew that there would be people here today going through that same thing. And he knew that you needed to know As you walk through your own season of despair and depression, you walk through your own experience of having it all and of making you sick, he knew that he could come alongside you and he could say, look, look at Solomon. I get your pain, child. I understand your despair, my son. I understand your disappointment, my daughter. Look at Solomon. He... He's not always wise in this book. He he doesn't have it all together. And, And sometimes he gets things completely wrong, but I have put this in here so that you will learn from him and so that you will know that even your deepest despair and even your darkest depression cannot separate you from my love. How good is God? And the Bible... The Bible is so much more interesting when you actually read it. And when you don't have to make all of its books end with tidy bows and happy endings when you let it speak on its own with raw power and then it has real impact. And in this case, for every one of you who's gotten all the breaks and you've been broken by them, every one of you who's had a broken faith and it doesn't mean you don't believe, it just means you don't care. Oh. But this book, the the, the bewildering therapy session of the book of Ecclesiastes, open it up and let it be that example of what you can see pointing to who you can. Tell me that God who inspires this truth doesn't deserve our best love. Let's pray. So Father, thank you that you are a good God. Thank you, God, that you understand every person within the sound of my voice who goes through the depression that doesn't have anything to do with circumstances. And Lord, that you understand that the people who can't comprehend those folks, you, you get us all. And I pray now, Lord, that you would make us into the kind of people who let what we can see on earth Remind us of who we can't yet in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.